Hello, I'm Katie Broomfield, a researcher in the Department of History at Royal Holloway University of London. Semaine's case is famous for the maxim, the house of every one is to him as his castle and fortress, and for establishing the law relating to the rights of entry into privately owned property. Richard Gresham and George Beresford were joint owners of a house in Blackfriars in London for many years. When Beresford died, ownership of the house passed to Gresham by right of survivorship. Unfortunately, at the time of his death, Beresford was in debt to Peter Semaine, who claimed he was entitled to all the goods Beresford owned at the date of his death. The problem was that Beresford's goods were all in the house which now belonged to Gresham. Having obtained a court order that he was entitled to the goods, Semaine instructed the Sheriff of London to recover them on his behalf. When the sheriff, acting as a bailiff, arrived at the house, Gresham shut the door and would not let him enter. The sheriff was therefore unable to recover the goods and Semaine issued proceedings against Gresham. The case is reported in Volume 3, Part 5 of the reports of Sir Edward Cook. Cook was a barrister who went on to become Attorney General, Chief Justice of the Court of Common Pleas and Chief Justice of the King's Bench. In 1579, he began keeping records of decided cases, and it is said his work is to the common law what his contemporary Shakespeare is to literature, and the King James Bible is to religion. I'm now joined by Dr David Juratic, a lecturer in the School of Law at Royal Holloway, University of London, to find out more about what happened in this case. David, was Semaine able to settle the debt he was owed by recovering Beresford's goods? Uh, no, he, he wasn't. Uh, the court resolved a number of points relating to rights of entry, but ultimately found that because nobody had advised Gresham that the sheriff was on his way, the shutting of the door of his own house was lawful, and judgment was given against Semaine. The courts held that Gresham ought to have been told about the sheriff's intention to attend and recover Beresford's goods. And the sheriff couldn't have just knocked on the door when he got there? Actually, the sheriff was criticised because he didn't knock on the door when he got there. He could have. What if he had knocked on the door and Gresham had refused to answer? Well, that's an excellent question. And in fact... The great question in this case is if the sheriff, after requests made to open the door and denial made, might break into the defendant's house to do execution if the door be not opened. If Gresham had not locked the door, the sheriff could have entered. But otherwise it was resolved that... It was not lawful for the sheriff, at the request of a common person, to break the defendant's house for thence would follow great inconvenience that men, as well in the night as in the day, should have their houses, which are their castles, broke. Men would not be in safety or quiet in their own houses. So here we're getting to the idea that a man's or woman's house is his or her castle. Yes, uh, that's right. As I said, the, the court resolved a number of points. First, uh, the house of everyone is to him as his castle and fortress and that he was entitled to defend it against an uninvited intruder, even if that resulted in the death of the intruder. Everyone may assemble his friends and neighbours to defend his house against violence, but he cannot assemble them to go with him to the marketplace or elsewhere for his safeguard against violence. And the reason for all of this is because his house is his safest refuge. What other points were resolved? Well, the court made a number of important distinctions to that general rule. For example, it was resolved that the house of anyone is not a castle or privilege, but for himself, and shall not extend to protect any person who flies to his house, or the goods of any other which are brought and conveyed into his house. Importantly for Gresham, the court clarified that this protection did apply to goods belonging to another that were not there fraudulent. Were there any other circumstances in which the court held it would have been lawful for the sheriff to force entry to the property? Yes, where the house itself was subject to a possession order or where a criminal offence was involved. In all cases, when the king is a party, the sheriff 
if the doors be not open, may break the party's house to arrest him. But before he breaks it, he ought to signify the cause of his coming and to make request to open doors. Published by Sir Edward Cook in 1605, Sir Main's case remains an important authority on rights of entry to this day. When enforcing a debt owed to another individual, as established in Sir Main's case, bailiffs are still required to give notice of their coming and on arrival may enter through an open door but may not force entry to a property. Sir Main's case also highlights the contribution of the common law to the development of citizens' rights. Common law is developed in the courts by judges who create precedents which must then be followed in subsequent cases unless the facts of the case are different or the case was decided in a lower court. The Supreme Court is the final court of appeal in the UK for civil cases and for criminal cases from England, Wales and Northern Ireland. The decisions of the Supreme Court are therefore binding and must be followed by all other courts in the United Kingdom except in the case of criminal proceedings in Scotland, where the High Court of Justiciary is the ultimate appeal court. As well as common law, laws in this country are also made by Acts of Parliament, known as Statute Law. It is now the police who act in respect of criminal cases, and their powers of entry, search and seizure are mostly set out in the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984. In both civil and criminal cases, lawful entry can be obtained only upon notice being given, usually by producing a valid warrant. As the statesman William Pitt the Elder said of this principle in 1763, the poorest man may, in his cottage, bid defiance to all the force of the crown. An Englishman's home is indeed, in law, his castle.